Welcome to the subject of agronomy. This is lecture 9 on the topic of nutrient management of N, P and K, nitrogen, potassium and phosphorus. This subject is part of the agricultural degree that is offered at North Melbourne Institute of TAFE, an education institution based in Australia. Please visit our website www.nmit.edu.au for further details on our subject, courses and education products that we offer. My name is Dr Nikki Cooley. In this lecture we are going to discuss nutrient management of the subgroup, subgroup of nutrients called macronutrients and these consist of nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. This is often abbreviated to NPK. We're going to start this lecture with a review on nutrient plant uptake. We are then going to look at soil nutrient variation, nutrient sources for all of the NP and K, soil testing and nutrient application. We will look in detail about different fertilisers that allow you to deliver different ratios and amounts of NPK in your cropping system. Nutrients are taken up by plants from the soil via the root system. In the following video, a simple description of uptake of both water and nutrients is discussed. It is important to realise both these mechanisms. Understanding the role that water plays in nutrient uptake is important when managing your nutrients. Please note that this is only an overview of nutrient and water uptake. The concepts underpinning these processes will be covered in more detail in Plant Physiology, ALM 214, and in Soil and Nutrient Subject. Let us begin with nitrogen, the macronutrient. The image on the left hand side demonstrates the element, element compo composition of nitrogen. It has an atomic number of 7. Nitrogen is a gas and clear. However, if you place nitrogen in a vial and then put a voltage across the vial, you get this beautiful purple colour. The image in the centre of the slide is when nitrogen is incorporated into the compound NH3. Nitrogen is classed as a primary macronutrient and is found in relatively high concentrations in plants. The reason nitrogen is so important to plants is that it is evolved in many functions. It is essential to the production of all proteins. It is required in the production of chlorophyll. It is required in the production of nucleic acids. Sugar content and yield can be affected if nitrogen is deficient. And finally, it interacts with other nutrients. Annual crop uptake of nitrogen can vary significantly from approximately 56 to 224 kilograms per hectare per year. This depends on not only the crop but also the yield. For example, alfalfa assumed yield for one tonne would take up 180 kilograms per hectare while as oats for every 0.84 meter cubed might take up 84 kilograms per hectare. From the example on the slide you will see that corn silage takes up the most amount of nitrogen from the example showed. Estimations of nitrogen uptake are useful you can do this by using tables such as the one shown in the previous slide and multiply by your yield. Or you can send off your sample for plant tissue nitrogen content and then multiply the fraction of your nitrogen content by your dry yield giving your total nitrogen plant uptake. Comparisons of actual uptake rates to your nitrogen fertilizer rates are useful as they enable you to determine how well your management practice is progressing. For example, excessive losses of nitrogen can be calculated using this method. 
The amount of nitrogen uptake will be largely controlled by the concentration of nitrogen available in the soil. An article published by Arsova et al. in 2012 on the use of heavy nitrogen in quantitative proteomics experiments in plants summarises what is known to date about nitrogen uptake. The review concentrates on using heavy nitrogen as the methodology for determining the quantitative nitrogen uptake. Plants take up nitrogen through dedicated high or low affinity transport systems in the roots. The main uptake form of nitrogen is as nitrate and ammonium salts, but organic nitrogen uptake in the form of urea or amino acids may also occur. The assimilation of inorganic nitrogen to organic nitrogen involves a series of tightly regulated, regulated enzymes. Nitrate is reduced to nitrite by nitrite reductase. Plasmid mocated nitrate reductase produces ammonium, which is then incorporated into the glutamine by glutamine synthesis, synthesase. Ammonium can also be fixed in cytosolic glutamine synthesase isoforms, again producing glutamine as the first organic nitrogen containing compound. Ammonium is often fixed in the roots whereas nitrate is mainly transported to the shoot before reduction. It can also be stored in vacuoles. Steps at which isotope discrimination is known to occur are indicated by the scale symbol on the illustrated figure. The amino acids noted in bold represent the main products of nitrogen assimilation and the enzymes are in italics. The blue line shows the ammonium uptake and the blue line corresponds with the metabolic processes that is involved, while the orange line shows the nitrate uptake and the associated metabolic processes this involves. As you can see this is quite a complex system. This particular plant is Arabidopsis and is often used as what is called a model plant in science. Concepts and theories from these plants are then taken and tested on crop plants in the field. There is still some way to go to fully understand the components of crop, crop plants as methodologies are developing. The image on this slide was obtained from J.S. Pat Partitioning of Carbon and Nitrogen in a Legume article in Functional Plant Biology. Here we have a hypothetical plant and its partitioning characteristics. You will note that leaves and stems are shown. The various figures relate to either the carbon or the nitrogen concentrations found in these components. Dry matter of a typical green plant contains a large and relatively cons constant proportion of carbon, somewhere between the re regions of 35 to 50 percent, virtually all of which is derived from the photosynthetic fixation of carbon dioxide by leaves or other green parts. Comparable values for nitrogen in dry matter tend to be more variable, with the lowest levels in the roots and the stems at between 0.5 and 1.5%, and considerably higher levels in the leaves, 3 to 5%, where much nitrogen is associated with enzymes involved in photosynthesis. Higher levels are encountered in seeds, 6 to 7%, and other storage organs in which large quantities of protein are stored. Most of the plants rely on nitrate or ammonium in the soil as their prime source of nitrogen, but certain leguminous plants gain nitrogen directly from the atmosphere by engaging in symbio symbiosis with nitrogen-fixing bacteria in the nodules of their roots. I have mentioned several times in this lecture that nitrogen plant requirements are delivered in the form of either ammonium or nitrate. The formula for ammonium is NH4+, and that of nitrate is NO3-. It is very important to understand these forms when looking at nitrogen fertilisation and how you will manage your nitrogen fertilisation. 
Of all the mineral nutrients, nitrogen has the most complex nutrient cycle, largely because nitrogen can exist as either a gas, both ammonia and nitrogen gas, whereas the other 13 minerals do not exist as gases under normal soil conditions. To help understand the various components of the nitrogen cycle, definitions and molecular formulas of numerous nitrogen forms are provided in the following table. Available nitrogen is generally considered to be the sum of ammonium and nitrate, although urea, a type of organic nitrogen, may also be plant available. You will note that nitrogen forms include nitrogen gas, ammonia gas, ammonium, nitrate, nitrite and organic nitrogen. Nitrogen cycling consists of nine major processes, plant uptake, exchange, nitrification, denitrification, volatilization, mineralization, immobilization, nitrogen fixation and finally leaching. Each of these processes and the effect they have on each other will influence the amount of plant available nitrogen and hence yield. We are not going to examine in this topic these processes in detail. However, in your soil and nutrition subject you will learn about these processes. Please be mindful that this is a complex system when looking at managing your nitrogen. Nitrogen uptake is regulated by signals, sensing and regular, regulatory elements. The figure on the slide is a visual representation of these processes. The plant in the middle is based on Arabidopsis, the scientific model plant. Plants express specific forms of iron transporters and enzymes having catalytic activities favourable for the uptake and the use of nutrients in the environment. They should also have these iron transporters and catalytic proteins expressed at ideal locations and timings to maximise the rate of nutrient assimilation. Besides increasing the capacities of transporters and enzymes, plants can modify their root architecture to make more efficient access to mineral nutrients available in the soil. This is an interesting adaptation Plant roots have, are known to have plasticity to modify their shapes by forming lateral root systems under different nutrient environments. In general, lateral roots proliferate on nitrogen-rich patches. However, if you examine contrasting phenotypes, you can find between the roots locally fed with nitrate and ammonium. There are three major nitrogen fixation processes, ammonium fertilizer production, lightning and biological fixation. Here I'm going to talk about nitrogen via, obtained via symbi symbiosis. Some organisms are able to convert atmospheric nitrogen, which represents approximately 80% of the air we breathe, into ammonium. Worldwide, Biological nitrogen fixation is estimated at 145 to 200 million tonnes per year, compared to approximately 90 million tonnes per year of world fertiliser. In crop production, in the US for example, the amount of biological nitrogen fixation is approximately one third of that is in the soil. Nodules generally pink to salmon colour when the organisms are actively fixing nitrogen due to a compound called legohemoglobin, which contains iron and is similar to the haemoglobin found in blood. The image on your, on your screen shows bacteria nodules on bean roots. Symbiotic nitrogen fixation is affected by many factors. These include inoculation, the soil pH, the moisture of the soil, the plant health, and the nutrient content in the soil. If either calcium, phosphorus, cobalt, boron, iron, copper or molybdenum are lacking in the soil, this can slow symbiotic nitrogen fixation down. While high levels of nitrogen in the soil 
can stop symbiotic nitrogen fixation when high levels are found in the plant. The plant stops releasing a bacterial attracting chemical. Once this chemical is no longer released, nodules are not formed as the bacteria are, not, are no longer attracted to the roots. The nitrogen cycle that we introduced you to earlier results in available nitrogen balance in the soil and cropping cycles. On the left hand side is a lift, list of the processes that increase nitrogen or gain nitrogen and in the right hand side is a list of nitrogen of processes that decrease nitrogen or lose nitrogen. Nitrogen is gained by addition of fertilizer, biological fixation, addition of manure, release from cat um, exchange sites, the process of min mineralization, precipitation and irrigation water. While nitrogen is lost from the system when plants take it up, denitrification, volatilization, sorb sorption of to exchange sites, leaching and immobilization processes. The image on the slide from the Noble Organization is a concept that illustrates how nitrogen is required at different amounts during different stages of crop development. Nitrogen requirement is not great initially but does increase when harvest is reached. You can use this information to alter your nitrogen management accordingly. Nitrogen can be broken down and supplied in either as urea or an amino acid. The carbon to nitrogen ratio changes depending on these molecules. For example, in the urea molecule, there is a 1 to 2 carbon to N ratio, while in the amino acid link in soy protein composition, there is a 3 to 1 carbon N ratio. Stephen Del Grosso et al. in 2009 published a paper on the global scale of gas greenhouse gas emissions. The conversion of native vegetation to cropland and in intensification of agriculture typically result in increased greenhouse gases, mainly N2O and CH4, and more nit nitrate, NO3, leach below the root zone and into the waterways. Agricultural so soils are often a source, but can also lack a sink of carbon dioxide. As stated by de Grosso et al, regional and larger scale estimates of greenhouse gases are usually obtained using the IPCC emissions factor methodology, but this is associated with high uncertainty. Therefore, they remodeled the greenhouse gas emissions using day scent biochemical model for non-rice major crop types such as corn, wheat and soybean. The following illustration shows the results of this modelling. In the past, growers have only had to worry about nitrates getting into the riverways. They haven't had to worry about their greenhouse gas emissions. However, with future generations looking very closely at carbon dioxide emissions and other global warming gases, processes and pathways in order to reduce these will probably be sought. This will be looked upon, I suspect, as a more sustainable type of farming. In the illustration on the slide from the Lee and Lai paper in 2003, where they were talking or examining the possibility of converting carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxide and sulphur oxide, all greenhouse gas emissions, into valuable fertilizers, mainly nitrogen hydrocarbonate that can enhance sequestration of CO2 into the soil and the subsoil earth layers reduce nitrates, contamination of the groundwater and stimulate photosynthetic fixation of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. 
The invention integrates pollutant removing fertilizer, production reactions with coal fired power plants and other energy operations resulting in clean energy systems that are in harmony with the earth ecosystem or at least these are the claims of the authors. <clears throat> it is worth noting that farming in future generations will require a better understanding of your ecosystems, not only your soils and your plants, but how your gaseous emissions interact too. Ensure when sampling for nitrogen that your protocol followed takes into account both spatial and temporal variations. Compare like time with like areas of your paddock. Ensure you take enough samples. Generally, only soil nitrate is sampled, not ammonium. Specifically, nitrate is mobile in soils and you need to take this into account when designing your protocol. Therefore, only taking a small subsurface sample will not give you a true or accurate indication of your nitrate levels. Instead, you need to uh, attain your soil from across your soil profile. Soil augers are useful for this type of soil assessment. If you take soil samples from shallower and deeper root profiles, ensure that you add the, vol the concentrations together to give you the total N across your root prof profile. Nitrate tends to be measured in either kilograms per hectare or parts per million. Use the information from the soil data to start to establish fertilizer regimes for your paddocks. Bear in mind though that fertilizer guidelines are only guidelines and they should be adjusted to both your region and historical results. Often fertiliser guidelines are designed to optimise yield and not quality. One of the most common fertilisers available on the commercial market is DAP or DAP. It is known as diammonium phosphate but also in chemical research uh, circles referred to as diammonium hydrogen phosphate. Its chemical name NH4 times 2 with a HPO4 group is shown on the slide. It is water soluble. When it is acting as a fertilizer it reacts with ammonium to produce phosphoric acid as shown on the formula on the slide. You may have come across DAP in other senses, as it has a, new, a, a numerous number of functions. For example, it may act as a fire retardant as it lowers the comp composition temperature of a material. It is also used as a yeast in wine making and brewing mead. It can be used as an, an additive to some brands of cigarettes. It can be used to prevent afterflow in matches for purifying sugar and as a flux for soldering tin, copper, zinc and brass. It can also be used to control precipitation of alkyne soluble and acid insoluble colloid dyes on wool. When DAP comes into contact with the soil it temporarily increases the soil pH. It is incompatible with alkaline chemicals. You, sip, you typically see it for sale with a commercial formula that may look something like 18460. These numbers represent the percent concentrations of the compounds the DAP contains. Therefore, 18460 represents 18% nitrogen, 46% phosphorus, and in this case, 0% potassium. The second fertilizer I want to introduce you to is that of MAP or monoammonium phosphate. This like D DAP is a superphosphate. It is water soluble and is produced via ammoniating phosphoric acid as in the formula on the screen. MAP is preferred to DAP at planting in those situations where too much nitrogen may affect germination 
emergence and early seedling root development. MAP is com commonly used where the planting fertiliser is placed in direct contact with the seed of a winter cereal and sown at narrow row spacing such as that in cotton. MAP is also less hydroscopic than DAP on account for its lower nitrogen content, making it less prone to settling in storage. This makes it suitable to place in silos for an on-farm storage through the time that it is stored in this way in silos should be kept to a minimum. Urea is another commonly used nitrogen fertiliser and is regarded as the most concentrated solid nitrogen fertiliser and the most economic to use. It contains 46% nitrogen. It can be applied on its own or with other nutrients such as DAP or murate of potash. It is usually, usually used for pre-plant or top dressing programs. You need to be mindful of potential impacts on germinating seeds or young seedlings as too high a concentration can burn these. It is soluble in water and can be used as part of fertigation programs. Urea is also used as a non-protein nitrogen supplement for ruminants such as sheep and cattle. Urea allows ruminants to make better use of low protein roughages, for example dry grass during dry weather and the onset of drought. Green urea is a new nitrogen fertiliser product. It is based on ammonium nitrate. It is a product that you top dress and do not incorporate into the soil. We have used this product in the Yang Ying Teaching and Research Demonstrator, Commercial Trial Rate, Paddock 5. Please see this lecture for further details on this product. Nitrogen can be attained in a liquid form and this is usually a concentrated solution of urea and ammonium nitrate. One such example is a product called EZN and it contains 42.5% nitrogen. This is not a recommendation for this product, but rather an example of its existence. On the 25th of January 2006, legislation was passed that stated any substance more than 45% ammonium nitrate needed to be controlled under what is now regarded as the SSAN. The link below, which will also be found on Moodle, can guide you to all the WorkSafe requirements and legal requirements that you have as a farmer if you are going to use this product. You will need to undergo such checks as a police check. You will need to check that you're not politically motivated for violence. It's called, that's called an PMV check. Organisations and individuals who transport or store SSANs will need to provide a security plan to the regulatory authority. It will have three main elements, personal management, site security and procedures. And only people with a legitimate need, such as farmers, are permitted to purchase and use SSAN products. Home gardeners are not allowed to buy SSAN fertilisers. Please be aware of your legal requirements if in your working career you have to come or choose to work with, with these substances. So how do you enable sustainable nitrogen management so that you are reducing your emissions and improving your efficiencies as well as retaining a good yield and quality? Well the answer is quite complex but one step in the right direction is to use enhanced efficiency fertilisers and this is known as EEF for short. On Moodle there is a connection, a link to the GRDC website fact sheet on reducing fertilisers nitrogen loss and nitrous oxide emissions. Please click onto this fact sheet and read the following article. After you have read this article, please answer the following questions. The questions are listed on your slide and a copy can also be found of these questions on Moodle for your convenience. Please bring your answers to the next class where they will be discussed. Now we are going to talk about the macronutrient phosphorus. 
On the slide you see three images. One image is of red phosphorus as a powder. The middle image is of many phosphorus molecules. And the left hand side is a Wikipedia image showing the elemental state of phosphorus. It has an atomic number of 15. So why didn't we need to be concerned about phosphorus in the soil? Well, put simply, phosphorus is involved in many plant function requirements. And this is probably the reason it is found in such high concentrations within the plant. These function, functions and processes that require phosphorus include energy transfer, protein synthesis, the development of reproductive structures, it is required for crop maturity, and finally for good and healthy root growth. I'd like you to stop the presentation here and using the Moodle link, please watch the following video. This is produced by Dr. Patel and illustrates the effect of potassium and phosphorus on foliage yield, quality and nutrients uptake and persistence. As phosphorus is a most limiting mineral nutrient for plant production, much research has gone into trying to understand why there are differences in phosphorus absorption in plants and how this might be improved. Such research is reviewed in the Ram Makers et al. publication in 2010. This publication was entitled Strategies for Improving Phosphorus Acquisition Efficiency of Crop Plants and reviewed certain techniques and mechanisms that could be potentially be used in genetic engineering. The figure on the slide is from this paper and demonstrates differences between a phosphorus efficient and a phosphorus inefficient genotype, looking at root structure and how this may enable increased efficiency of phosphorus uptake. The development of transgenic plants may be used in agricultural practices. To complete your notes on scientific advances in phosphorus, I'd like you to watch the BBC video, which is an interview of Singrid Hoyer, who discovered a important step forward in our understanding of phosphorus and how we might use this in rice production. Now let us talk about the mineral phosphorus. The application of phosphorus is second to that of nitrogen in many farming institutions. There are two forms principally that are available to the plant in the soil. These are the phosphates, hydrogen phosphate and dihydrogen orthophosphate. They are collectively known as the orthophosphates. Other forms of phosphate that are available in the soil include sorbed phosphate, the mineral phosphate, calcium phosphate, this is relatively insoluble in the soil, aluminium phosphate, again relatively insoluble in the soil, iron phosphate, relatively insoluble in the soil. Organic phosphate slowly supplies available phosphate to plants and microorganisms. The cycling of phosphorus in your agricultural system is critical to phosphorus management. I'm going to spend a few slides here familiarising you with such this cycling process. Phosphorus is cycled as phosphate, sorbed phosphate, mineral or in organic forms. The plant can only obtain phosphorus in the phosphate form. The content common in agricultural soils, phosphate tends to make up less than one mg per litre or one part per million of phosphate in the solution. This represents less than 1% of the total soil phosphate, i.e. it's found in very low concentrations. Organic phosphate makes up between 25 and 65% of the total phosphate in the soil. This depends on the soil type. And sorb phosphate represents the remainder. 
The presence of mycorrhizal fungi, which develop a symbiotic relationship with plant roots and extend thread-like hyphae into the soil, can enhance the uptake of phosphorus, as well, especially in acidic soils, where phosphorus tends to be low. The image on the slide is a simplified version of the phosphorus cycle. Phosphorus can be obtained from either weathering phosphate rocks, fertilisers or residues from either plants or livestock. Once it enters the soil, it is then cycled in the soil depending on the form of which it is in. This cycle shows that, it is, that its phosphorus is converted between mineralised and non-mineralised versions of the compound. Remember, it is the mineralised version of the compound that the plant can take up from the root. You will also notice that leaching can occur in this system. It is worth noting that organic phosphorus decreases quickly with soil depth, parallel, paralleling decreases in organic matter. Phosphorus moves to the root surface through the process of diffusion. As phosphorus moves towards the root at higher rates, then water is moving via transpiration. Phosphorus uptake is different for different crops and is yield dependent. It tends to range from 22 to 67 kilograms per hectare per year. There are some examples in Australia in the southern regions that have received such a high accumulated application of phosphorus that no further applications are required and yet a sustainable optimal yield can still be obtained. Soil testing is a critical step in the management of, of phosphorus. In order to conduct a soil test, you should select random samples of the soil surface, that is 0 to 10 centimetres, typically between the rows and across the paddock. This is the best way to establish phosphorus status of your soil. Establish yield zones across the paddock based on yield data. Your observations will help you inform you of this in your first and second years. Phosphorus may be a cause of some of this yield variability. Adjust your phosphorus fertiliser according to your variability of your soil type and your yield zones. This will increase your profitability and allow a more sustainable approach to managing phosphorus. Different extractable methods for measuring any compound will yield different results and require a different interpretation. Typically, it is best to standardise your extraction method based on understanding your soil type and composition, pH, and what information you are after. In order to achieve this, you need to understand some of the differences between the tests. On the slide is a copy of a table I have produced, summarising some commercial soil tests for P. You can find a full copy of this on Moodle for you to download and examine in further detail. The tests that I have compared are Corwell P, Orson P, Phosphorus Buffering Index and Diffusion Gradients in Thin Films called DGT test. Each of these tests has a different requirement or measurement and with that an associated measured range. Sometimes this range may be in parts per million, other times it may be as a unit. The Corwell P test is based on the Corwell P test and extracts your phosphate in an alkaline 0.5 molar sodium hydrogen carbonate at pH 8.5 for 16 hours. It is different from the awesome P as the time of extraction varies. It measures the level of easily available P. If used alongside the buffering index, PBP, PBI, gives a good indication of the levels and accessibilities of P in the soil. The unit it is given in is mix of extractable P per kilogram of dry soil. The, buff, the phosphorus buffering index gives an indication of soluble P. 
It works on the principle that P is absorbed by clay minerals and or precipitation in the soil and it determines the partitioning of P between the solid and the solution phases of the soil. It is extracted in 0.01 molar calcium chloride which contains four mix of potassium in the form of potassium hydrogen orthophosphate. It is typically measured in units and gives the p-sorbing capacity of the soil. It can show you how much of fertilizer in a soil can be fixed into unavailable forms. The buffering capacity of a soil refers to its ability to maintain its p concentration in the solution as the plant roots absorb. The P awesome test is similar to the Coolwell test. However, extraction is for 30 minutes rather than 16 hours. It does indicate a maximum plant growth and yield, but these are different amounts from the coal P as the extractable time is quite different. And finally, there has been some um, question of the correlation of tests such as the coal P and the awesome P in certain soil types and their ability to estimate plant yield and assess how much fertilizer should be add, added. The development of a DGT is a diffusion gradient test. This is where soils are moistened up to 100% water holding capacity for 24 hours. Then the P is extracted through a, a membrane or film. The P is measured in the film. This test can, re can measure P values from 0 to 200 micrograms per litre and is recommended for soil types such as calcareous and acidic soils with high iron or aluminium. It measures initial soil P concentration and ability of the soil to resupply the soil P pool. It is designed to mimic plant roots. When you are considering future soil pea management, it is always good to have a good historical record. His historically, the following is good to include in your records. The soil sample strategy, that is, where did you take the soils from, what depth did you select, and what spatial variation are you able to determine from your soil sampling? Do you have one sample or many from the paddock, for example? Your temporal variation, how is your pea varying over time? When you're looking at this, you need to consider what crops were grown and how much fertilizer with respect to pea was added each season. Ensure, ensure that you understand the soil test used and only compare like soil tests. And finally, not all laboratories are equal. There are accreditation agencies that operate across Australia which ensure a guaranteed standard of analysis. One such agency is the National Association of Testing Authorities in Australia. Ensure that you understand the accreditation for where your soil samples are tested and that this accreditation is appropriate for your requirements and for comparison of both present, past and future soil sampling. A soil can it be defined as either responsive or non-responsive to phosphorus. Soil tests can reveal how responsive or non-responsive addition of phosphorus fertilizer will be. This will largely be dependent on the soil composition. On responsive soils, take advantage of row spacing options. For example, 12 kilograms per hectare of applied phosphorus on a row spacing of 15 to 18 centimetres may be recommended. However, you might be able to achieve the same productivity by applying 9 kilograms per hectare of phosphorus at a crop seeded at a row spacing of 25 to 30 centimetres. If you have a non-responsive soil, all row positions are acceptable for managing phosphorus. An important part of your phosphorus management is being able to calculate your crop phosphorus requirements and usage. For example, the loss of phosphorus 
has to be calculated in its requirements. You may see that your crop requires 10 kilograms of phosphorus per tonne of plant. You may find a further loss of say 3 to 3.5 kilograms per tonne and a further loss of 0.5 kilograms per tonne if you were to produce straw or burn. Not only does the way you manage your crop alter your P requirements and usage, but so does the crop itself. For example, pastures are thought, if, if you grow pastures, it is thought best to add extra P on the establishment of your pasture, because this can improve your pasture performance. This is particularly important if you are aiming to use a low density pasture. Cereals are thought of to require high amounts of phosphorus fertilizer, while pulses and canola require less compared to the cereals. The following table summarizes phosphorus removal. This is given in kilograms per ton of grain per hectare. The take home message that you will note from this, these observations are that different plant species remove different amounts of phosphorus. For example, wheat and barley can remove between 2 and 4.5 um, kilograms per tonne of grain per hectare, while canola can remove up to 7 kilograms per tonne of grain per hectare, a big difference. Phosphorus and its application. When thinking about applying phosphorus, you should note that it has limited soil mobility. It is advisable to place in or near the seed at sowing, as this is the most effective way. However, in some crops, particularly canola, phosphorus too close to the seedling can cause toxicity issues. Top spreading of phosphorus is a very inefficient application technique and is not recommended. Phosphorus requirements are greatest during initial growth. There has been some research to show that foliar phosphorus application is a good mode of application as it is allows efficient, efficient uptake. However, there is a balance Liquid P delivers crop requirements at a lower rate per hectare on a calcareous soil and it can be mixed with other nutrients. But you need different infrastructure to apply liquid P versus granular P and the cost of liquid P is much higher than that of granular P. Only on a calcareous soil or a few cropping systems where the growth and yield benefits outstrip the extra expense of the liquid P. An example of this is in the ear pens pencilla, where 3 kilograms per hectare of liquid phosphorus for wheat is better than 10 kilograms of phosphorus per hectare of the granular product. Therefore, the economics should be carefully considered before deciding which type of phosphorus to apply. So what should your application rate of your fertiliser actually be? Well, in order to make this decision, you must first decide if you are going to maintain your p-values or if your aim is to increase your p-values. Increasing p-values is sometimes referred to as capital applications. This is a balance between your crop growth, your yield and the cost of the additional phosphorus. Is it worth doing this? All of these should be based on soil phosphorus test values. So if you wish to maintain your applications, you must put enough P to cover the export of phosphorus from the paddock in animal products, accumulation of phosphorus in animal camps, losses in runoff or water leaching to depth, any crop use of P and note that phosphorus can accumulate in the soil because it has can it, because it can become tightly bound to soil particles. 
You should note that any loss of phosphorus through runoff is considered not ideal as leaching can lead to undesirable environmental consequences. Usually though, in regular maintenance, only a small amount of phosphorus leads to runoff and is, tends to be ignored for phosphorus fertilising budgeting purposes. An exception in this case, however, can lead to the leaching losses from sandy soils with very low phosphorus sorption capacity. If, however, you wish to undertake capital P rises, you need to replace, as per the maintenance phosphorus management, and increase the amount to raise the soil phosphorus values. Therefore, you need to understand your soil tests. If your soil PBI is equal to 80, and the aim of your raising P is to raise your cool well soil test by 2 mg of phosphorus per kilogram of soil once over the year, you would apply an extra 5.4 kg per phosphorus per hectare. In order to account for the amount of maintenance P to apply per hectare, you can use the following calculation. Kilograms of phosphorus per hectare equals phosphorus divided by the DSE times by your average stocking rate. This is an example of how to calculate phosphorus management on pastures. You can use the following table to assist with the previous calculation. The amounts of phosphorus required are influenced by the phosphorus buffering index value of the soil as shown on the top columns in Table 1. For example, if the soil has a PBI value of 80 and the aim is to raise the Colwell soil test level by 2 mg of phosphorus per kilogram of soil over a year, it would be necessary to multiply the 2 by 2.7 this would give you an extra application of 5.4 kilograms per phosphorus or per hectare to apply. Tables 2 and 3 from the 5 Easy Steps Guide, there is a link to this on Moodle, can show you how soil and animal loss factors may influence your phosphorus management and how you may overcome this. So what commercial product of phosphorus should you use? Bill Manning et al. in their paper Phosphorus Fertilisers Does Product Choice Mattered started a dialogue with adequate phosphorus is not only an essential component of profitable and sustainable crop production but is also an increasing component of crop gross margins. In recent years there have been large price movements for phosphatic fertilisers leading to interest in ways to improve phosphorus fertiliser use efficiency. There are several commercial forms of phosphorus. Originally, rock phosphorus is the raw material used in the manufacture of most commercial phosphate fertilisers on the market. During the production and processing of the rock phosphate, impurities can result However, this is mined from a finite supply of phosphorus ore deposits and now manufacturing has moved more towards the production of phosphoric acid. The percent of fertiliser that is water soluble has been shown to affect the yield and this needs to be considered when selecting a commercial form of phosphorus. Phosphorus tends to be mined in the US, China and South Africa. The following depicts a generalised diagram showing the various steps used in the manufacture of phosphate fertilisers. This was obtained from the University of Minnesota. And further details on commercial production of phosphate fertilisers can be found on this website and a link to this will be provided on Moodle. Please take note 
about the production of fertilisers from phosphates, such as the superphosphate of lime, which is a mixture of two salts, calcium dihydrogen phosphate and calcium sulphite dihydrate. This is produced by the reaction of sulfic, sulfonic acid and water with calcium phosphate. Commercial sources of phosphorus are single phosphates, single superphosphates, SSP, and they contain about 8.8%, triple superphosphates, TSP, which contain about 20.7% phosphorus, MAP, which can typically contains 21.9% phosphorus, and DAP, which contains 20% of phosphorus. However, you need to check from the manufacturer your exact composition of your nutrient fertilizer. I have alluded in the previous slides about the commercial production of phosphorus and how these su supplies are from a finite source. Not only is it important to manage your phosphates well on your enterprise from an environmental perspect perspective, but also because the commercial production of phosphorus may be of some concern for future generations. The following YouTube video is an outline of what is called the Phosphorus Challenge and where these authors perceive there may be problems in future years to come. Please watch this video and take notes about why you should be more sustainable in your farming practice with respect to phosphorus. The following YouTube video is an interesting video that talks about increasing phosphorus uptake with micro essentials. Please watch this video and take notes to complete your notes on this topic. And finally, the last compound we are going to explore in this lecture is that of potassium. Potassium has an atomic number of 19 and is often abbreviated as a K. The image on the slide shows you a raw source of potassium and also a model of the molecular structure of potash, one form of potassium. So why is potassium an important macronutrient and what do plants use it for? Well, when you look upon the following list, you can see just how essential potassium is to the plant. It is required for optimal photosynthesis, for adenosine uh, triphosphate production or ATP, for the translocation of sugars through the crop, for protein synthesis, for starch production in grains, and assist nitrogen fixation in legumes. This is certainly an impressive and functionally important list to the plant. The importance of potassium can be seen by the fact that it is absorbed in rather large quantities, in some situations even exceeding the amount of nitrogen. And another unique feature is that the bulk of uptake of potassium occurs within a short period of time in annual crops, for as cereals usually before the onset of flowering. Daily potassium uptake rates between 5 and 10 kilograms of potassium per hectare are not uncommon for high yielding annual crops. When crops with a low potassium content fail to release adequate amounts of potassium into the soil solution, yield is decreased and quality impaired and the crops are more susceptible to biotic and abiotic stresses, irrespective of the supply of other nutrients. That is, potassium can become a limiting factor. Please see Lecture 8 for more details on limiting factors. A long-term experiment with grassland was conducted at Rothamsted in the UK and showed that the content of exchangeable potassium after seven years without potash fertilisation hardly changed. It even increased slightly. Although considerable amounts of potassium have been removed by the harvested grass, This is an interesting observation because it shows that substantial quantities of potassium are absorbed by plants from a fraction of the soil potassium 
which is not determined by routine soil tests. This data was sourced from the reference by Johnson et al. in 2001. In some plants, potassium aids in structure supporting stems, for example corn. It can also help disease and assist in lod lodging. Potassium plant uptake occurs as potassium ions. In many soils, potassium is abundant but unavailable to the plant. The concentration of potassium ions in the soil is controlled by inorganic processes. Potassium is present in finite concentrations in the soil and can become a limiting factor. Please see Lecture 8 for the concepts of limiting factors. Understanding potassium cycling can improve fertiliser management and increase profitability. The next few slides will be dedicated to understanding the components of potassium cycling in soils. Potassium can be found in several forms in the soil. These include as potassium ions, exchangeable potassium, non-exchangeable potassium and mineral potassium. The concentration of these forms varies greatly. For example, potassium ions, which are available to plants, are only found in very low concentrations, ranging from 1 to 10 parts per million. Exchangeable and non-exchangeable potassium is found in similar concentrations, usually between 1 and 2 percent, while mineral potassium commands most of the soil. That's 90 to 98 percent. Exchangeable potassium is weakly sorbed to the soil particles and can be readily replenished by liquid potassium. However, non-exchangeable potassium is held in the layers in clay layers by strong covalent bonds, making it inaccessible to the plant. And mineral potassium is contained largely in unweathered primary minerals such as feldspars and micas. Potassium is not bound in organic forms unlike compounds such as nitrogen and phosphorus. Therefore, on decomposition of plant material, it rapidly returns to the soil. The in inputs which cause availability of potassium include weathering, clay fixation and release, sorption and desorption, leaching, erosion and plant uptake. Potassium has been traditionally expressed as potash which is K2P formula. This figure summarises the potassium cycle in the soil plant animal system. As you can see in this figure, fractions of potassium occur in the soil solution and potassium exchangeable and potassium fixed are related to each other through reversible exchange, exchange processes. Potassium removed by uptake of plants and or leached into the subsoil is replenished by potassium released from both the potassium exchangeable form and the potassium fixed pools. There can be simultaneous release of potassium from both pools of soil solution or a linear exchange process from the non-exchangeable to the exchangeable pool and from the exchangeable pool to the soil solution. Whether one or two of these possible mechanisms predominates is of little practice, practical importance provided that the potassium in the soil solution is replenished quickly enough to meet the maximum demands of the rapidly growing crop. When there is surplus potassium in the soil solution after the addition of fertilizer or manures for example Potassium is transferred to both fractions through exchangeable and fixation processes. From this I hope you will take away the complexity of the potassium cycle in the soil plant animal systems. Understanding the relationship of the different forms is important in your management of your potassium. The aim of soil testing of potassium is to determine the amount of potassium available to the crop. Standard soil sampling methods can be employed ensuring that both temporal and spatial aspects are considered. 
Solution and exchangeable potassium ions are the two important forms of potassium that you need to consider in any test. The conventional method for determining potassium is to extract it in one molar ammonium acetate and measure the potassium in the resulting solution. This is not always a good measure, particularly in cool and dry climates. A new method has been developed based on an anion exchange resin probe. This mimics the plant root absorption and the potassium in the resin is then measured. Potassium is reported in parts per million and is usually only measured in the top subsoil surface as this is where crops utilise the potassium from. Potassium is produced commercially across a number of products. MAP and DAP can be used as a source for potassium, but check the relative concentrations as sometimes potassium can be low in these compounds. Potassium liquids usually contain either monoammonium phosphate or monopotassium phosphate. Potash is perhaps the most common potassium fertiliser used in agriculture and it contains the compound potassium chloride. Over 90% of global potash production is used for plant nutrition. MOP, murate of potash, is one of these products and it is spread onto the soil surface prior to tilling and planting. It may also be applied in a concentrated band near the seed. Since dissolving fertiliser will increase the soluble salt concentration, banded MOP is placed in the side of the seed to avoid damaging the germination of the plant. Deeply buried potash deposits are found throughout the world. The dominant mineral is silicite mixed with halite sodium chloride which forms a mixed mineral called silicinite. Most potassium minerals are harvested from ancient marine deposits deep beneath the Earth's surface. Potassium is a relatively abundant element in the Earth's crust and production of potash fertilizer occurs in every inhabited continent. However, potassium sulfate, or SOP, another form, is rarely found impure in nature. Instead, it is naturally mixed with salts containing magnesium, sodium and chloride. These minerals require additional processing during the production of this compound. And this brings us to a conclusion for all the facts and concepts we are going to cover in Agronomy 1 on nitrogen, phosphate and potassium. The management of these compounds requires a fair amount of detail from how the plant takes up the nutrient to what are the functions these nutrients are required for. Functionality affects efficient timing and application. It is imperative to do soil testing in order to optimise your MPKs. It is also important to understand that different tests will give you different results. Ensure that your sampling protocol matches your mobility of your nutrient and your variation of your nutrient. Ensure that temporal comparison is accurate, that is, that you are comparing soil nutrients at similar or the same time. I have introduced you to some of the nutrient products. There are a vast range of commercial products available. This brings us to the end of this lecture.